certainly a blessing to us. Um, I call your attention to a couple of things in your bulletin. Uh, first of all, um, there is our insert about um, the Pentecost Special Day offering and new church ministries and the revitalization effort that has been not just for brand new churches, but also for the churches that have access to those innovative ideas and um, good learnings about a new landscape that we're working with uh, in being church. So I encourage you to check that out. Upcoming events, we will have a sign-up sheet next week. We didn't do our geraniums uh, for Pentecost today. Oftentimes we um, do a sign-up and do Pentecost geraniums. Uh, instead, I, I stole some, I didn't steal them. I got some begonias for just a little color today um, because the geraniums that I saw didn't look all that great. But we are going to do a sign-up um, for flowers um, in memory or honor of someone. That, that sheet will be out next week um, so that when we do our mulch on the first, we can do some planting as well and have some pretty color in our front yard to be inviting and welcoming and sort of having our space celebrating um, the good work of God. So look forward to that. Uh, this week on Wednesday is our World Religion Study. We're on Buddhism this week. Lunch Bunch this week also coming up uh, at the Eaton Park. Um, and that we're going to do the one um, in McMurray um, for this week. And so uh, I think that that address is actually in your newsletter from last month, but if you need it, just touch base with me. We'll make sure you know where to go. The dates for Worldview Camp um, are in your bulletin as well. Now is the time to sign up. Uh, the church does pay half for students going to camp, and um, May is, an early, is our early bird time. So we pay less and you pay less um, if you sign up this month. And Lily and James will be at a conference camp at June 23rd to 29th, that's the high school camp, going into 10th, 11th, and 12th, and having just graduated. And then she is also serving as a counselor at Cairo Junior and Minicamp. So Cairo all Junior of the other and Minicamp. So she will be at all the camps. <laughs> um, so... Um, your child, if they're thinking about it, maybe it's their first time, they will at least know one person. <laughs> um, just make sure you mark your dates. The only other additional date that you'll find in your bulletin is that June 1st date um, for us to go out and spread some mulch, bring your rake or shovel or whatever people use to do such things. And um, also the, the June 4th date is a Tuesday instead of a Wednesday that week for our study, so that's a change. Prayer concerns, we've got um, a really exciting one um, for Shaylin, who is in labor right now. Um, she was induced early this morning, and um, so we are very excited as we await the arrival of her baby boy, and just please pray for her. Uh, I heard from Bonnie Rudolph, who had another fall this week because she's been dealing with ongoing vertigo. And um, thought that that had started to get a little better, but uh, it surprised her and has not. Uh, we also just want to especially lift up Horst. He's been on our prayer concerns for quite some time now. But he's got a lot of testing ahead of him this week and sort of decisions to make about what's best for his care. And so just pray for him and for Doris and for the family as they um, go through that process, especially for his health, but also for discernment for everyone to know what's best. Um, do I have other prayer concerns I can add or something I missed because I could not find my bulletin from last week at all? I'm trying to be very careful. So we've had Karen um, on our list.
list right. because she was anticipating her corneal transplant and that is being rejected right now. Well, she had the corneal transplant two weeks ago, but now it's being rejected. Now that like the tissue one. is being rejected. Yeah, yes. The new one is being rejected, so. We will be in for a record for those. Let's begin our service in song by singing Sweet, Sweet Spirit, number 261. Please stand as your eagle. I thought we saw it first, but I think we 
our own songs for prayer by singing Come Holy Spirit, Heavenly Dove, number 248. Mm -hmm.
Hear us, O God. And to your promises we entrust all those whose needs are known to us today and those whose needs are known only to you. Grant peace to all through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. to it as you approach the table, and I pray that you have that experience of feeling God's presence in ways that you didn't even know you needed during this time. All who believe in Jesus are invited to this life-giving Join me as we prepare for the feast by singing Breathe on Me, Breath of God, number 254. Mm -hmm.
this space to live more fully into your gospel, into the life that Jesus calls us to. Bless all those who can't be with us today, especially those who have lost their way and yet are so thirsty.
Our scripture for today is Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones have dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves. And bring you up from your graves, O oh my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O oh my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. I just want to apologize again to Bruce because I hit him with an offering plate. That is not a new trend in trying to <laughs> fundraise. It is just me being really clumsy. I don't often do that on purpose. <laughs> I'm obviously thinking a lot about the weather um, today and especially in mind of the humidity, which is really killing both me and my hair. <laughs> and I don't know that we really notice it here in Pennsylvania anymore. Like we say, it, oh, it's not the heat, it's the humidity. But we're just so used to it. It's like the old adage of, you know, you ask a fish, how's the water? And they say, what's water? You know? <laughs> it's just around them all the time. It's just part of the world. And we can get that way too. We don't really notice until we go someplace that's really dry. Feel that difference. And that's sort of the place we sort of have to take ourselves for the scripture, not just in terms of the weather, but in terms of the people. These are folks who feel like dry bugs. The year is 587 BC. CE, as they say, the Odyssey. It was an incredibly low point in Israel's history. Their nation had become like a desert floor covered with dead skeletons. The Babylonians had wiped out the Israelite army. This should not have been a surprise. The Babylonians were the strongest nation in the known world. Israel was a rinky dink little nation. They were sort of nothing in comparison. It was no contest, and in 587 BCE, all their young Israelite warriors were killed. The temple was destroyed. The capital was destroyed. The people were destitute. Everyone was hungry or on the edge of starvation. And the Israelites who were alive were taken prisoner, chains around their necks, and dragged back to Babylon. And so the nation had become like this opening image of the scripture, dead bones, dry bones, no life left to them at all, strewn across the desert. 
door. And the Hebrews begin lamenting to themselves, God, where are you? You clearly can't help us or won't, or maybe you're not there at all. Or punishing us for our sins, so it doesn't matter whether you're there or not. We are here, left to rot and die in the desert. We can become like dry bones. So it's into this bigger story that today's scripture is said. God sends Ezekiel out to see this destruction and devastation. He answers him, asks him an important question. Mortal, can these bones live? Now that's a good question, but it may be a little weird question for today. After all, today is Pentecost, and we're supposed to be telling the story of Jesus' terrified followers huddled together in a room after his ascension. He has gone back up to heaven, and they are left to fend for themselves when the Holy Spirit comes upon them like tongues of flame. Aren't we supposed to be remembering how they began to tell the story of Jesus in languages of the people that were visiting Jerusalem from all over the known world? Aren't we supposed to be laughing about how they were accused of being drunk? Well, sure we are. It's Pentecost. And so see, we just did it just now when you told the story. But frankly, even that story still boils down to the same question. Most folks gathered, trying to figure out what's next for their lives and for their faith, feeling like they've lost Jesus twice now, floundering and afraid. They probably reflected on stories in their faith that reminded them of times when it felt like the end of the world. And maybe they, too, asked themselves the question, can these bones live? It's never a bad question, really. I bet you asked it before of your own bones, or the bones of the church. So let's see if Ezekiel's conversation with God can tell us something that can answer the question for the disciples and for us. Ezekiel does not have an answer to this question, by the way. He completely dodges it. He would have been a great politician. Instead, he turns it back to God. Mortal, can these bones live? I don't know. Can they? You tell me, God. And God doesn't answer with words either. Instead, he gives these equal instructions. Prophesy to these bones, he says. Exactly what does that mean, to prophesy? Our culture associates the word with future telling, but that is not what it means. It means simply to speak or spit sing by the inspiration of God. It doesn't have to mean that you're saying anything at all about the future. When you prophesy, you are just a messenger, telling people what God told you to tell them. I don't know if you've ever seen kids fight that won't speak to each other. But you know that game that they sometimes play. Uh, Lisa, can you please tell Kevin to pass the butter and then Lisa would say, Kevin, as you just completely heard Jana say, she says, please pass the butter, right? This little game of, of passing the word along. From, it's just that. That's all prophecy is. The mouthpiece of God. I am the messenger for what God has told me to tell you very specifically in the scripture. I'm not claiming myself. To, I'm saying, if I were a prophet prophesying, that's what would be happening. And so, God tells Ezekiel to tell the bones something, to pass on this message. They don't need to know about the future. They're dry bones. <laughs> but God has a message for them anyway. Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And Ezekiel passes on the message to the bones. It has to feel a little bit odd. If you were Ezekiel, you'd have to hope that no one walked past you and saw you talking to a valley of dead bones. Back then, you couldn't 
pretend that you were on your phone? <laughs> oh, hi. God said to tell you that doesn't work back then. But one of the things I try to take from Ezekiel's actions here is that he isn't attached to how his behavior looks to outsiders, nor is he attached to the outcome. He is not afraid that he's going to do this thing and it's going to fail. That's not his business. That's not his problem. His focus is on being faithful. God told me to do something, I do it. That's my only job. The rest is for other people to worry about. And so Ezekiel is faithful. He passes on this work. We don't know whether he was surprised or not when it started to work. I have to assume I would be shocked and amazed to see in real life what I've only seen at the end of the movie Sleepy Hollow. Layer upon layer of these bodies were restored and regrown. That would not have been pretty. Bone to bone and flesh to flesh. Associate Professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, Christopher B. Hayes, tells us that the Bible uses bone and flesh as a motif for kinship. We see family relationship tied up with those words. To take just one example, in Genesis 29, when Jacob comes to stay with Laban, Laban welcomes him with these words, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And Jacob stayed with him. And the same two Hebrew words are used in Ezekiel for the bones and the flesh that, bring, that God brings back together in the valley. We're seeing a promise of reunification to have a people who have been torn asunder one from another. It's not just the dryness, it's the separation. And by using those particular terms for the way these bodies are attaching, God is sending a signal promise that God's people will be together again. But don't forget that these bodies, although they are restored physically, are still dead. I mean, it's already a miracle. I'm not saying this wasn't miraculous. I couldn't do it. I'm not poo-pooing God's work here. But they weren't even zombies. They're just bodies. And that's saying something to Israel, too. I can do a lot of work here, you can do a lot of work here, but without the breath of God, without God's Spirit, life, real, true, abundant life, it's not going to happen. So next, God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the breath. This part's really important because breath has always been important to God. It's how the world was made. In Genesis, we read that in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. The wind from God is ruach. It's the same word in Hebrew as spirit and breath. This isn't just a nice breeze. This is the breath of God across the water. So just a little while later in Genesis, we aren't surprised when that creative breath is at work again. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. I don't know how... Ezekiel prophesied to the breath. God sort of pointed it, pointed him at it, the four winds. You know, where do you look? Where exactly it is? You just have to start prophesying and hope the breath can hear you, I suppose. And the breath is brought from the whole world. God's spirit 
across the land already, brought into this place, and God puts his breath into them. The scripture says they lived and stood on their feet a vast multitude, and God offers the same hope to Israel. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. So the first question gets answered not in words, but in deed. Can these bones live? Yes. Apparently they can. And we sort of guessed, didn't we? We sort of knew that answer was coming. Ezekiel probably did too. He knew enough about God to know the power and might of God. But yes, God would probably do that. And of course, even though the world wouldn't have believed it of Israel, my guess is that Israel knew it too. Despite how lost and alone they felt, they were still complaining to God. Because part of them knew that God could breathe life back into them. The sad apostles knew it too, knew that God, if he was strong enough to raise Christ from the dead, to ascend him into heaven, could surely make something out of that ragtag group they could be. So can these bones live is maybe less important than how can these bones live? Ezekiel didn't have to ask that question. He was told right away, but for the disciples and for us, it may be more important. Did these bones have raised themselves? Were they just being lazy? Laying around, not raising themselves up? they just trying harder? Could they have done it? If they had had more skeleton meetings, then they could develop a strategic skeleton plan for the next five years and have the right management in place. Could they have raised themselves? The bones were dependent on the faithfulness of those who God called and the power of God himself, especially the Spirit. The breath of God. Hope isn't circumstance dependent, but we forget that sometimes because we try to hope in ourselves. Or we think we should be strong enough to have what we need to make life happen. We have to learn to rely on the Holy Spirit. Room for the Holy Spirit. Because try as we might, we need God. We have to be in prayer and in study, dependent on the Word of God, the prophecy of God. Ezekiel is passing on the Word to these bones. We also have to be open to the creative working of the Spirit, which can look really weird. And impossible at the time that we're called to be faithful. It can look like some guy talking to bones or some apparently drunk apostles at night in the morning in Jerusalem. And we can't be rooted in our past and experiences or in our appearance and what the world might think. So much that we shut our mouths when God is trying to breathe life. The power of the Holy Spirit isn't just for raising bones from a desert floor, but for raising us from the dead. Not just at the end of our lives, but on a Tuesday, after a fight with our kid, or after we haven't been able to pay one of our bills, or when we get a bad test result, or after a car accident, or when we feel lost and alone and don't even know why, or when we as a church know that we can be more than we are, but don't know how. It's time that we let that breath in. We turn to it before ourselves and our own strength and our own wisdom to put flesh back on our bones and life back in our lives. Can you pray with me?
thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for that sacred day when you gave the gift of the Holy Spirit to those apostles awaiting your word, awaiting your instruction, awaiting what was next for their lives. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that gave dry bones life. We ask that we would continue to be reliant upon your Holy Spirit, that we would acknowledge it more and know it better when we are dry and lifeless, when hope feels lost. Help us to be careful that we're not trying to raise ourselves up, but that we would reconnect again to the power of your word, to the power of relationship, to the power of faithfulness, but especially to the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would give us the courage to trust that what you would call us to would be right and would be fulfilled, even if it might be new or uncomfortable. Help us to have hearts of discernment and minds and bodies and spirits open to your precious spirit. In Christ's name. We enter into song with me as we sing Spirit number 249. Please stand as your equal.
life and the creation be your delight. May Christ Jesus give hope to your dreaming. May the Holy Spirit, your advocate and supporter, set your hearts ablaze with a passion for peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In Christ's name, amen.